Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk in general aviation. This week, it's a Friday mailbag special, and we'll talk in detail about the jet crash at Hot Springs, Virginia, earlier in the week. And then we'll have your listener emails discussing topics from last week, including feedback from several airline pilots on the United Flight 2477 taxiway overrun in Houston, and on the 10 recent fuel-related accidents we talked about. Hello, my name is Max Truscott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. Last week, we talked about recent fuel-related accidents and the GA aircraft in which these accidents are most likely to occur. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 318. And if you're new to the show, welcome, glad to have you here. But go ahead and take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. But first, let me remind you that this is a listener-supported show, supported by, yes, you. And we have several new ways that you can show your love and support for the show. So if you would like to join the community, go on out to our new support page at aviationnewstalk.com slash support, where you'll find links to support the show via PayPal, Venmo, and several other options. And when you make a donation, I'll read your name on the show. Coming up in the news for the week of March 11th, 2024, there's been a third fatal business jet crash in just five weeks. Student pilot starts her up, and so is the percentage of female students. And we'll tell you about an unusual lawsuit in Massachusetts that stems from a collision between a Black Hawk helicopter and a snowmobile. All this and more in the news starts now. From GlobalAir.com, an IAI 1125 Astra SP jet, November 1125 Alpha, crashed in rural Virginia on Sunday, killing all five people on board. The jet was landing at the Ingalls Field Airport, HSP, in Hot Springs, Virginia, but crashed short of the runway, hitting trees and crashing into a nearby hillside. The Astra jet was flying from the Fort Lauderdale International Airport. The pilot, co-pilot, two adults, and a child were killed. Police said that the jet was landing at about 3 p.m. And I'll talk more about this crash during my updates. From AINonline.com, fatal business jet accidents climbed steeply in 2023. Fatalities soared for U.S. registered jets, but decreased for non-U.S. registered ones. Six accidents involving U.S. registered business jets killed 23 people in 2023 versus zero fatalities in 2022, according to preliminary data gathered by AIN. Five occurred under Part 91, killing 15, and one charter accident accounted for eight fatalities last year. Interestingly, the number of 2023 fatal accidents and fatalities was identical to those of 2021. Meanwhile, the number of U.S. registered business jet non-fatal accidents decreased by more than half, 11 in 2023 versus 26 in 2022. Runway excursions continue to be the most common type of incident or accident, with 71 recorded by turbine business aircraft last year. Turboprops were involved in 32, of which 12 were classified as accidents. Of the 39 excursions by business jets last year, 16 were classified as accidents, one of which was fatal to all four aboard. Now, by my count, we've had three fatal business jet accidents this year in just a five-week period. First was the Hawker 900 XP crash near Grand Junction, Colorado. Then was the Challenger that crashed in I-75 in Naples, Florida. And this past week, the Astra Gulfstream 1125 that crashed in Hot Springs, Virginia. From avweb.com, student pilot totals increase and female participation is up. The FAA issued 69,503 new student pilot certificates in 2023, which was 13,334 more than the prior year. Statistics released by the FAA to coincide with International Women's Day continue to show incremental growth and interest in aviation with at least 7,102 women taking the first step compared to 5,566 in 2022. The stats also revealed that both sexes are taking it up even later in life with the average age of all student pilots going up to 35.2 in 2023 from 35.1 in the prior year. It continues a trend that started in 2010 when the average student age was 31.4. Meanwhile, the total number of certificated pilots in the U.S. increased by 14,124 to 490,470, and 3,287 of those were women, counting for 6.8% of the total female population. Of that total, 174,000 active ATPs were listed, up 7,375, 
and 9,071 female ATPs were counted, meaning that 5.2% of ATPs are women. All pilot categories showed at least some increase in numbers over the year, except for the recreational certificate. From generalaviationnews.com, Flight Training Survey reports new pilots take fewer weeks but spend more to earn a certificate. While it takes less time to earn a pilot certificate these days, it costs more. That's one of the key takeaways from the fourth annual State of Flight Training report released last week during the Redbird Migration Flight Training Conference. The report analyzes answers to a survey of flight training providers, CFIs, DPEs, prospective student pilots, student pilots, and pilots. In 2024, more than 1,700 people filled out the survey. A vast majority, 94%, were from the U.S. The report notes that the median time for a student to earn a certificate or rating decreased over the past four years from 30 weeks in 2020 to 24 weeks in 2023. However, the median cost to earn that certificate increased from $9,000 in 2020 to $14,000 in 2023. The report breaks down the median cost to earn certain ratings as follows, $10,500 for sport pilot, $14,000 for private pilot, $12,000 for instrument rating, $15,000 for a commercial single, and $6,000 for an initial CFI. And the report notes that those prices are probably going higher in 2024. It finds that 69% of flight training organizations raised their prices in the last 12 months. Just 14% said they haven't raised their prices and don't plan to in the next 12 months. When asked how busy was your business in 2023, flight organizations reported high levels of demand. For example, 36 reported that they had a wait list, while 30% said they were very busy, and 22% said they were moderately busy. But the same can't be said for independent CFIs. Among those responding, just 4% reported they had a wait list, while 11% said they are very busy, 30% said moderately busy, 36% said not very busy, and 19% said they were hardly flying. Larger flight training providers consistently reported better business results than smaller providers. In 2023, independent CFIs rated their business outcomes as a 3.2 on a scale of 1 to 5, while large flight training organizations, those with a fleet of 20 or more training aircraft, rated their outcomes as 4.6. DPEs also weighed in with 48% reporting that they had a wait list in 2023. Another 32% said they were very busy, while 16% said they were moderately busy. Full-time DPEs had about 245 applicants in 2023, while part-time DPEs had about 130, according to the report. Flight training organizations reported 85% first-time pass rate, while independent CFIs report a 77% first-time pass rate. DPEs reported a 78% first-time pass rate. DPEs were also asked how today's student pilots compared to those of five years ago, and the findings are not encouraging. 5% said better, 32% said the same, 45% said worse, and 18% said much worse. And the primary reason for failing a checkride? Well, piloting skills tops the list, followed by training oversight, aeronautical decision-making, knowledge in flight, and knowledge ground. On the flip side, what factors contributed to training success? Topping the list is student preparation, followed by instructor's preparation. Next is the ability of the instructor, followed by the ability of the student, according to the report. And you can find the full report at simulators.redbirdflight.com slash state hyphen of hyphen flight hyphen training. And I'll include a link to that in our show notes. From avweb.com, United pauses pilot hiring amid Boeing delays. United Airlines is the latest carrier to pause pilot hiring with the company citing ongoing aircraft certification and manufacturing delays with Boeing. In an internal memo seen by CNBC, United addressed its pilots noting that it will pause new hire classes for the months of June and July. The airline also emphasized that participants in United Aviate and United Military Pilot Program will continue to receive priority in the hiring process. According to the memo, delays in Boeing's deliveries have impacted United's growth projections for 2024, particularly affecting the expected delivery of 80 MAX 10 aircraft. Executives say that none of these aircraft have been certified and their delivery timeline remains unknown. Despite the setback, United said that it has already hired more than 450 pilots this year and is on track to hire more than 800 by the end of April. The company plans to resume pilot hiring in July. And we have two stories from Down Under from blog.forflight.com. Boeing acquires Oz Runways, a leading Australian electronic flight bag provider. 
Oz Runways will report into ForeFlight, enabling the companies to share knowledge and enhance their respective applications to the benefit of customers. ForeFlight recently entered Australia with CASA certification as a data service provider. And from ShepNews.com, victims' phone video helps explain plane crash. Video recovered from a crash victim's phone has helped explain what happened on an ill-fated joy flight that killed four people, including two children in Australia. Six days before Christmas 2021, the plane left Redcliffe Aerodrome north of Brisbane. Less than three minutes later, the single-engine Rockwell International 114 aircraft crashed in the mangroves near the shoreline, coming to rest upside down. The pilot, 67, and his three passengers were unable to escape and died. Video recovered from a passenger's phone included footage inside the plane before takeoff, as well as the brief flight. It showed the pilot was doing pre-takeoff checks from memory and not using any written list. The video also received a perceived technical difficulty distracted the pilot during the checks, and he did not complete them, failing to look at fuel tank selection. The ATSB said most of the fuel had moved to the plane's right-wing tank while stored in the hangar. Less than three minutes after takeoff, the Rockwell 114 crashed. However, they said it was likely that the fuel tank selection prior to takeoff was switched to the almost empty left wing, which led to the engine stopping soon after takeoff. The engine stopped barely 90 seconds after takeoff, and the pilot attempted to return to the runway for landing. He did not maintain glide speed, and the aircraft impacted water near the shoreline. He had extended the undercarriage for landing, which the ATSB believed contributed to the aircraft inverting when it collided with two-meter-deep murky water. This likely resulted in occupant disorientation and added difficulty in operating the exits, reducing their ability to escape. The ATSB said the incident highlighted the need for approved, readily available written checklist and for pilots to get into the habit of restarting them from the beginning when interrupted. From insurancejournal.com, pilot seat blunder led to LATAM Airlines' mid-air plunge. A mishap with a cockpit seat may have thrust the pilot into the controls of a Boeing 787 plane flying to New Zealand, triggering the sudden plunge that injured 50 passengers, according to the Wall Street Journal. A flight attendant serving a meal on LATAM flight hit a switch on the seat, propelling the pilot forward and pushing down the aircraft's nose, the newspaper said. According to the report, the switch is fitted with a cover and isn't meant to be pressed if a person is in the seat. And I've read in other sources that this is used when there's nobody in the seat and you want to move the seat so that you can get into it. The plane was on its way to Auckland from Sydney when it suddenly lost altitude. Multiple reports have described how the incident sent passengers, including at least one baby, flying into the ceiling of the cabin. While no one was seriously injured, seven passengers and three crew members were taken to the hospital after the flight landed in Auckland. And finally from WashingtonPost.com, a man who crashed a snowmobile into a parked Black Hawk helicopter is suing the government for $9.5 million. Jeff Smith was whizzing along on a snowmobile one evening a few years back when something dark appeared in front of him. He hit his brakes, but he couldn't avoid clipping the rear tail of a Black Hawk helicopter parked on the trail. The March 2019 crash almost cost him his life and is now the subject of a federal lawsuit by the Massachusetts lawyer. He's asking for $9.5 million in damages from the government, money he says is needed to cover his medical expenses, lost wages, as well as hold the military responsible for the crash. Smith said, quote, the last five years, there's been surgery, recovery, surgery, recovery. Smith lost the use of his left arm, suffered respiratory issues since the crash, and hasn't been able to work full time. His lawyers in the years-long court case argue that the crew of the Black Hawk that flew down from New York's Fort Drum for night training was negligent for parking a camouflaged 64-foot aircraft on a rarely used airfield, also used by snowmobilers. Smith argues that the crew didn't do enough to protect him, including failing to warn snowmobilers of the helicopter's presence on the trail, leaving the 14,500-pound aircraft unattended for a brief time and failing to eliminate it. The helicopter landed on an airstrip approved by the FAA, and the crew members testified that trainings are often conducted in similar locations. But Smith, who said he had snowmobiled on the trail for more than 100 times, said the last time an aircraft used it was decades ago when he was a child and never a military aircraft. His attorney, Douglas Desjardins, said, Our argument from the beginning has been that it's incompatible to have a helicopter land on an active snowmobile trail. And he added that the lawsuit was filed after the government failed to respond to their damages claim. The Army internal investigation showed pretty clearly that the crew knew that they were landing right before or right on an active snowmobile trail, he said. 
The government has argued that the crew wasn't told that they were landing on a snowmobile trail. They also pushed back on claims they could have prevented the accident, saying there was nothing in their policies that required illuminating the helicopter. They also attempted to cast blame on Smith for the accident, claiming he was driving his sled more than 65 miles per hour at the time of the crash. And it's a much longer article, but the key takeaway for me is that as airmen, we have to be constantly aware of our surroundings and how our actions may affect others. Coming up next, a few of my updates, and then we'll get to your feedback, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's get to the good news. First, congratulations to mega supporter Andre Tikhanov. He says, Dear Max, thank you for your continued contribution to the safety of the GA community. I've been listening for over a year, signed up to your podcast when I started preparing for my instrument check ride. I also loved your book on the G1000, which helped me tremendously during the transition from round dials to glass cockpit. I'd like to share that I've passed my instrument check ride and your podcast, especially the mock instrument check ride episode, which I listened to at least three times, helped tremendously. I'm happy to report that I've signed up on Patreon and look forward to continuing my aviation journey with your guidance toward the commercial and CFI ratings. Well, congratulations, Andre. And congratulations to Patreon supporter Jason Nadell. He says, Max, I want to share that after a two and a half year journey, I've completed my private. I want to offer encouragement to any listeners who may feel down about their progress. Flying is a beautiful thing. Keep at it. Throughout my training, I listened to nearly all of your past episodes, and they were very helpful. Thanks for all you do for the GA community. And congratulations to Patreon supporter Chaz Ryan. He says, Max, thanks for the outstanding program. I earned my instrument rating. I listened to many of your shows multiple times on approaches and other instrument-based skills. Additionally, and you mentioned it in an episode, about earning an IGI, that's the instrument ground instructor, if working toward an instrument rating. So I just completed my knowledge test for the AGI in IGI. Well, congratulations to all of you. And I want to talk a little more about the fatal Astra accident at Hot Springs, Virginia this week. That aircraft was a 1991 Astra Gulfstream 1125 SP. And from an ad for the aircraft from a prior sale, I can see that it was updated with a Collins Proline 2 EFIS. The airport is located on top of a plateau at an elevation of 3,972 feet. The aircraft was attempting to land on the airport's only runway, which is runway 25. That runway is 5,600 feet long and 100 feet wide, and there are multiple approaches to the runway, including the ILS-25, for which the aircraft had been cleared. The weather, particularly the winds, may have played a part in the crash. On Saturday, the day before the accident, it had been snowing throughout the day, and on Sunday, the weather was significantly better except for the wind. The crash occurred about 2.55 p.m., and the weather was reported at that time to be scattered 2,000, broken 2,400, and overcast at 4,500 feet. The winds were reported from the west at 1.9, gusting to 38 knots. I believe those winds were coming in at 2.70, so a 20-degree crosswind from the runway. I looked at the ADSB data for the flight and loaded it into a simulator so that I could see what it looked like from the pilot's perspectives. Now, the last recorded altitude on ADSB was at 4,700 feet, about 1,000 feet above the field elevation. The aircraft can be seen descending on the ILS at about 1,000 feet per minute in what looked to be a very stable approach. However, what really caught my attention was the terrain. To the aircraft's right was a ridge that paralleled the aircraft's path. And perhaps more significantly, between the aircraft and the airport was a deep valley roughly perpendicular to the ridge. Since the wind was coming from the right, it would have passed over the ridge before reaching the aircraft's flight path. And since the plane was on the leeward side of the ridge, you'd expect that wind to result in a downdraft. And I would expect that downdraft increased as it dived into the valley that I could see in front of the aircraft. Now, I went into the NTSB database to see what other accidents have occurred at this airport. Three of them mentioned strong winds as being factors in those accidents. And here's a comment I found on pilotsofamerica.com. The poster wrote, I've been into HSP, which is the airport, a few times, mostly flying the ILS-25. With the winds coming from the west, they're whipping right over the ridge, causing a huge downdraft on short final. Wind was insane yesterday across most of the state. Last airport I would want to go to is HSP. Now here's the kicker. 
The aircraft was purchased on November 27th, 2023, so about three and a half months before the accident. As I've mentioned in the past, there's a particularly high accident rate for recently purchased aircraft. And from online reports, it appears that the owner had hired two pilots, but we'll have to wait for the final NTSB report at least a year from now to find out how much time and type each of those pilots had. Now let's talk about another accident. I learned about it from a blog that you might be interested in following. It's written by my friend Sylvia Spruck Wrigley, and her blog is called Fear of Landing, which you can find at fearoflanding.com. And of course, I'll include a link to that in our show notes. Now, some 15 years ago, I got to know her when I was actively blogging at maxtruscott.com, and she and I would cross-promote each other's articles. Sylvia focuses on accident analyses and has written a number of books on the subject, which you can find on her website. She wrote an article a couple of weeks ago called The Fatal Flight Instruction Spiral Dive Technique, which really piqued my interest. So I went to the NTSB report and also downloaded the ADSB data and ran it through a simulator. Now, regarding that accident, I've mentioned in the past that I found multiple factual errors in NTSB reports, and this one doesn't sound quite right to me. First, let me mention a couple of points that came up when I was at USC in December taking their aircraft accident investigation course. The point was made several times that a person on an accident team will sometimes hold doggedly to an idea about what caused an accident and try repeatedly to persuade the rest of the team that their idea was the cause of the accident. And often these people are wrong. So it's important for the investigator in charge to continue to investigate and gather more information and not get derailed by one person's strong convictions. And another point that was made is that investigators often get misled because they try to make the current accident fall into the same category of some previous accident that they feel was similar. So past experience can bias a current investigation. Now, the probable cause from this accident was the flight instructor's failure to recover from a steep spiral turn during an instructional flight. And yet, the accident data from this crash doesn't look like a steep spiral turn. Steep spiral turn is a commercial maneuver, and frankly, I've never felt at risk when teaching this maneuver to clients. And here's where I think the investigators allowed themselves to get misled. The report says, a review of the private pilot's logbook revealed the flight instructor had provided training for the steep spiral turn maneuver on numerous occasions during the private pilot's flight training. It also says a surveillance security video showed the airplane in a very steep spiral turn that continued until the airplane was out of view of the camera. Now, this accident was in a Cessna 172 G1000 and occurred in November 2021 in northern New Jersey, not too far from where I used to live. The report says, in part, while on an instructional flight, control of the airplane was lost during a flight maneuver and the airplane impacted the terrain in a heavily wooded area. Data recovered from the Garmin G1000 revealed that the airplane climbed to a cruise altitude of about 6,400 feet and remained on a northwesterly heading for the first 17 minutes of the flight. The airplane's airspeed began to decrease due to an engine power reduction from 2,400 RPM to 1,300 RPM. The airplane began to pitch nose up, ultimately reaching a maximum pitch altitude of about 37 degrees as the airspeed slowed to 28 knots indicated. The airplane reached a left-wing down bank angle of 102 degrees and a nose-down pitch attitude of 79 degrees. The G-1000 recorded the airplane's descent rate at over 8,000 feet per minute three seconds later. A security video showed the airplane in a very steep spiral turn that continued until the airplane was out of view of the camera. Based on the data recovered from the G-1000, the reduction of power was intentional and the aerodynamic stall was induced. The flight instructor's logbook and receipts from previous flights show the flight instructor and private pilot had practiced steep spiral turns on several occasions. So I wrote to Dr. Catherine Cavagnaro, who's a spin expert who we've had on the show a number of times, and asked, does this sound like any steep spiral you've seen? I'm hardly a spin expert, but it looked to me like they were trying to spin the aircraft. What's your take on what they were doing? Catherine wrote back and said, I agree with you. It sure looks to me like they were practicing spins or some really sloppy power-off stalls. What I find curious is that the report seems to describe a momentary recovery with a 2,000-foot climb and a 32-degree pitch up. Incidentally, most folks overestimate the pitch angle, so that would look oddly high to most pilots. After that, the aircraft apparently went back into the spin spiral and hit the ground. Something interesting about 172s is that you can excite a spin 
as apparently they did. But even with pro-spin pilot inputs, the spin will turn into a spiral. So I wonder if the report discusses spirals as opposed to spins because they noted what probably became high airspeed values during the maneuver. Again, it would be interesting to see the data set from the aircraft. So certainly the strong pitch up at the beginning of the maneuver is nothing like any steep spiral I've ever seen, where essentially the first thing you do is reduce power, lower the nose as opposed to raise the nose and go into a bank. So even though this aircraft may have ended up in a spiral, it's almost certain the accident sequence did start with an attempt to perform the commotion maneuver, a steep spiral. I guess one recommendation I'd have for the NTSB is that they might consider hiring more CFIs or even consulting with a CFI when analyzing data to try to figure out the maneuver being performed. And of course, this is a listener-supported show, so I'd like to take a moment to invite you to come join the Aviation News Talk community. If you've been listening for a while and indeed this is one of your favorite shows, well, please help support the show. And if you're looking for some rationale for doing that, think about what you might pay a flight instructor for their time to spend an hour with you helping you become a more proficient pilot. And we've made it so much easier for you to join the community to support the show. All you need to do is go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash support, and you'll find five different options that you can use to send a donation to the show. Now, see if you know any of these people, and most of them are actually from two weeks ago because I forgot to read a number of them last week. Thanks first to Arturo Guerrero, who's back with us as a mega supporter. Those are the folks that donate $50 a month via Patreon. Also, thanks to new Patreon supporter, John Stencil. And we also have a number of new PayPal supporters. They include Daniel Kelly, Barry Harper, who's a repeat donor, John Waters, Michael Maselli, Alex Lunny, and Mark Killian. Thanks so much for your support. Coming up next, your listener emails, including a number of comments about the United Flight 2477 aircraft that went off the taxiway into the grass at Houston last week. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's get to your listener feedback, starting first with feedback on United Flight 2477, which we talked about in episode 318, which appears to have purposely landed long and then unfortunately was too fast to make the last turnoff at the end of the runway and ended up in the grass and collapsing one of its landing gear. First up, this comment from Rob Mark. He and I were talking on the phone earlier this week, and he said that when he was flying part 135 in a citation, He once landed long to get to the end of the runway sooner, and the captain said, don't ever do that again. Rob asked why, and the captain said, we don't land long in turboprops and jets. And you'll hear more about that from other readers here. This is a comment from Mark Rubin from LinkedIn. He said, really dumb, landing long well outside the required touchdown zone. Should have gone around, unstable approach, just to save a couple of minutes of taxi time. Trying to make a 90-degree turn at 30 knots back to the schoolhouse for this crew. And by the way, you may think that 30 knots doesn't seem like that fast for a turn, but there's a big difference between the speed at which you can turn a car and the speed at which you can turn an aircraft. Down in a car, the differential solves the problem of the difference between the distance traveled by the inside and the outside wheel. And in a turn, the inside wheel obviously travels a shorter distance than the outside one, which has to make fewer revolutions. But there is no differential on airplanes because aircraft wheels almost always are free to roll. There is no drivetrain. So power and forward momentum are provided by the engine thrust. Now, you may have heard of differential braking, but of course that is something totally different, which means that in many small light aircraft, you use the brakes to steer the aircraft if there is no control of the nose wheel, which would be the case in uh, Diamonds and also uh, Cirruses and, and also the Cessna Corvallis. So you do have to be much slower in an aircraft to make it turn. And what I've learned from your feedback is that most airlines require their pilots to be at 10 knots or less for a 90 degree turn. Now, listener Alex Lunny wrote to me and said, regarding the 737 runway excursion, I couldn't help think about this tweet. And he said a tweet, which was from a Delta pilot. And he included a picture of what had been posted by uh, at 876 pilot, Marion wrote, 54 minutes early, my new domestic record, Delta Flight 455, and it says arrived 40 minutes ago. That was a flight from LaGuardia to Atlanta. 
And regarding that, Alex wrote, I doubt if we'll ever know if speedrunning was a factor in the United incident at Houston, but I can certainly see how it would lead to incidents like this and erosion of safety culture. He also says, thanks for all your hard work on the podcast. It's my favorite and a can't miss. So that got my curiosity up about speedrunning. So I sent an email to an airline pilot friend and I said, hey, is speedrunning a thing in the airline world? And I sent him a link to an article that referenced the tweet that I just read. And I wrote, it made me wonder if the United Pilot at Houston might have been trying to set a record. Flight Aware said that flight was running 24 minutes early when he ran the plane off into the grass. I'm thinking airline safety departments would want to discourage these kinds of social media posts bragging about speed running. And this is the reply that I got. And I'm not mentioning the airline pilot's name. He wrote, I've never heard of speed running. I certainly hope it's not a thing. <laughs> and I certainly hope that too. He says, this is the reason that most airlines, except Southwest, pay the greater of the scheduled flight time or the actual flight time. If you're going to be early, there's no financial incentive to be even earlier since the pay is the same. If we're late, on the other hand, we, except for Southwest, get paid for any overblock time, and this also removes incentives to try to rush things. Now, if a pilot commutes to work, in other words, lives somewhere other than where they're based so they have to catch a flight home, there is a powerful incentive to be early enough to be able to make that flight home. I sat in the jump seat of a 757 flown by another airline when the captain was taxing at 30 knots because he wanted to make sure he caught his flight home. And he writes, I like Brian Schiff's saying about this, slow down to go fast. So true. He says, at my airline, being 350 feet over the threshold or touching down 5,000 feet down the runway, which was the case with the Houston incident, would lead to a trigger in our FOQA, or FOQA, the Flight Operations Quality Assurance Program, and would be flagged as an unstable approach. That would lead to a phone call to the crew to figure out what happened and possibly additional training. This is a situation that we call PINC, which means Procedural Intentional Noncompliance, a willful decision by a pilot to make an action that is in direct contravention to our official policies. And here's feedback from another airline pilot. And again, I'm not going to mention his name. He wrote, good analysis of the 737 overrun at Houston. If your ADSB analysis is correct, there were some willful violations of SOPs or standard operating procedures, and the FAA might get involved. There is a mandatory 500-foot stable callout, and if they were over the approach end at this altitude, that's probably not stable. That's a mandatory go-around. Also, turns are supposed to be made at 10 knots. So if they were at 30 knots, they were three times the prescribed speed. What is befuddling is that both of these would set off FOQA alerts, so they would have gotten phone calls even if they succeeded. And another airline pilot also wrote that if you listen to the communication given to the aircraft behind them, you hear one of my ATC pet peeves. The missed approach for runway 27 at Houston is a climbing left turn to 3000. Now a jet doing this isn't a 172. It's going to climb rather aggressively and it's very busy. 15 seconds after commanding the go-around, ATC commands runway heading and maintain 2,000. I know ATC was concentrating on the overrun, but it's too late. That ship has sailed. The airplane's flight management system has probably already captured 3,000, and they are already turning. Either give this as an alternate missed earlier, or, at the latest, as you command a go-around. To his credit, the non-flying pilot of the airplane going around tells ATC, stand by, as he's obviously doing the aviate part of aviate, navigate, communicate. And he adds three other points here. He says, one, there is no such thing as permission to land long in the part 121 world. That is an unstabilized approach and requires a go around. Two, a landing that cannot be made in the touchdown zone requires a go around. The touchdown zone being defined as the first 3,000 feet of runway past the threshold or the first one third of usable runway length, whichever is shorter. Three, the flight manual permits High-speed turnoff exits at 60 knots, but turns greater than 30 degrees should be at 10 knots. And from Google, I thought you'd be interested in learning a little bit more about FOQA. It says that United Airlines has the largest and longest-running FOQA program. FOQA is a voluntary safety program that involves collecting, analyzing, and visualizing data from aircraft. The goal of FOQA is to improve flight safety and operational efficiency, FOQA programs can help airlines run efficiently and can comply with regulatory agencies and safety audit requirements. FOQA programs use data generated by the pilot or by systems in the aircraft. The data can be used to analyze flight performance data against pre-established events and parameters and can handle recorded flight data from tens of thousands of flights. 
FOQA also includes tools for single flight analysis and event investigation. FOQA is important for many reasons, including increased safety, maintenance planning, pilot training during simulated instructor-led or real-world flight events, and providing highly detailed, graphic-rich prompt feedback to the global flight community. And there's actually an advisory circular regarding FOQA, which would be FAA's AC120-82. And from simpleflying.com, they write, FOQA has been an airline industry program for nearly half a century at its core. It's an airline-run data collection program that derives all of its information from quick access recorders on airplanes. This data is crucial in order to understand how pilots are actually flying the airplanes in revenue operations. Safety and training departments care deeply about this information because it allows them to see strengths and weaknesses in their programs and identify topics of importance for recurrent training. FOQA consists of countless in-flight data collection points that identify and flag countless parameters. Examples include flap over speeds, excessive bank angles, high-low pitch attitudes at high altitude, high approach speeds below 1,000 feet, landing past the touchdown zone, and countless other events. And by the way, next week we'll be talking with Chuck Kelly about a program that the Cirrus Owner Pilots Association is doing that provides pilots with feedback similar to what's being done through FOQA. And now here's a recording from my friend Rob Mark. He talks about the time he got to fly an A380 and how Airbus handles the decision about what taxiway to use when exiting the runway. Hey, Max. It's Rob from JetWine.com. I enjoyed listening to episode 318, especially about that runway excursion in Houston. Um, I think you really nailed it when you said trying to save time often costs us much more in the long run. And also that it's unwise to try to plan your turnoff on a runway before you land. But this all reminded me of a story I wrote many years back that illustrated why the transport category aircraft manufacturers and airlines think about this topic just a little bit differently. In fact, the Airbus engineers specifically designed a system to tell pilots where the aircraft would be able to turn off the runway long before they landed. I thought maybe some of your listeners might find this interesting. In April of 2009, Aviation International News asked me to write a story about a then-new system that Airbus was calling Break to Vacate. The best part of the story was that they sent me to Toulouse, France, to conduct the evaluation on site at the Airbus factory. So about 10 days later, I arrived in Toulouse with a couple of other writer pilots to attend the first technical briefing. The Airbus engineer told us the brake to vacate technology was designed to help reduce the uh, then increasing number of runway excursions, something that still happens apparently. Anyway, the company uh, realized most runway excursions evolve from poor pilot decision making. But the other reason they designed the technology was to prevent pilots from cooking the brakes on their airplanes trying to make a specific turnoff. Now, most large turbine aircraft and, well, most business jets I'm familiar with are equipped with an auto braking system. But all that does is tell the aircraft how hard the pilot wants to have the brakes operate. In fact, when we use these systems, we keep our feet totally off the brakes. So maybe think of these as dumb brakes of sorts. But wait, (laughs) there's more. The Airbus engineers also determined this new system would increase traffic flow at busy airports because pilots would actually clear the runway at the taxiway they tell the tower they will, uh, rather than miss it and have to shove the power up to taxi down to the next one, forcing someone else to go around, uh, like what happened in Houston. The Airbus engineers also told me that system would work with the auto braking, but added a whole bunch more landing information, like the destination airport that included the runway lengths and taxiway configurations, uh, the outside air temperature, the wind, and the aircraft's landing weight. Then they told me that we'd all be heading out in the Airbus demo aircraft the next day to watch the system in action, and that we'd each have a chance to fly it from the left seat. So I got pretty jazzed about that because I had flown some large airplanes before, but I'd never flown an Airbus. Then they dropped the bomb on me. Uh, The Airbus folks told us all we'd be testing brake to vacate in their A380. (laughs) So here I was in France 
about to fly one of the largest airplanes in the world, and I had nobody to tell. It, it was crazy. Well, anyway, after I left the Airbus factory that afternoon, I, I realized none of my friends back in the States would ever believe I'd flown an A380. So I went into town in Toulouse and bought myself a small video camera to capture the event. I asked one of the other pilots, uh, a Lufthansa guy, I think, if he'd be my cameraman while I was in the left seat. So next morning, we all boarded the airplane, and I realized the A380s uh, was the biggest cockpit I'd ever seen. In addition to the two front seats for the pilots, there were five jump seats against the back wall. <laughs> okay, okay, enough about how enamored I was with this monster airplane. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Anyway, after takeoff, uh, Airbus uh, test pilot uh, Claude Allais and I finished some air work and slow flight so I could get used to the airplane. <laughs> yeah, like 40 minutes in the left seat of an A380 and I was feeling comfortable. <laughs> right. Anyway, we started back to Toulouse to test the brake to vacate system on the airport's 11,493-foot runway 32 left. Claude put the data in the FMS and uh, it told him that we could turn off at Sierra 8, the intersection about mm, 7,500 feet downfield. Now, of course, being a good journalist, I asked Claude about our landing weight that day. Uh, we'll all be at uh, about 1.3 million pounds, he said. All I could muster was, okay? <laughs> anyway, he suggested we do a fully coupled approach the first time around. So we, we were all set up on final, and these, these big aircraft have a radar altimeter that counts you down on final approach to the end of the runway. Uh, that was a huge relief to me since the, the main gear is way behind the cockpit of an A380, and I mean way behind. The pilots, uh, even when the mains touch down, the pilots are still about 30 feet above the ground. So when I heard it say 500, I knew we were close. And the altimeter counted down every 100 feet until I heard minimums. And that's when I clicked off the autopilot. But I didn't mess with anything. That's what Claude told me to do, because the A380 clearly had a better idea of what to do than I did. Then I heard the 50, 40, 30. And then the famous Airbus instruction, retard, retard. That was my signal to pull the big uh, four uh, Rolls-Royce engines back to idle. And all I needed to do was add the tiniest bit of back pressure on the side stick at, to, to raise the nose before we touched down. Now, once we were down, I pulled the engines into reverse. Interestingly, uh, people might not know this, the A380 only uses reverse thrust on the two inboard engines. And that's because they were afraid the outboards are going to start throwing up junk from the ground. After all, the wingspan on this airplane is just short of 262 feet, so nearly the length of a football field. After the aircraft touched down, the auto brakes went to work, and as we approached Sierra 8, I was easily able to make a 90-degree turnoff. Now, by the way, the, the brake to vacate software knows the taxiway configuration, and it doesn't turn itself off once the airplane is slowed until it's down to 10 knots if it's a 90-degree turn like I was making that day. If the airplane knows it's going to make a high-speed turnoff, which is normally about a 45-degree turn, the system shuts off at about 40 knots and hands the airplane back to the pilot. So after the flight, a bunch of us started asking questions, and one of the other guys said, so if the airplane had missed Sierra 8, what's the big deal? Wouldn't it just taxi down to the next intersection? Claude said, do you realize how much power it would take to move 1.3 million pounds and get it rolling toward the next intersection and then slow it again to make the turn? And how much time that takes? I'd never thought of it that way, but it was pretty well said. Anyway, I thought Airbus had designed a pretty cool system and that by now, it would be part of most transport airplanes. I guess not on that United Bird at Houston. After we shut down, I turned around to the Lufthansa pilot who gave me the thumbs up on the video. And if you'd like to watch it, you can head over to, all one word, The Real Jet Wine on YouTube. And I think maybe, Max, if you're really nice, you'll put a link in the show notes 
to that. I hope you enjoyed this. See you guys next time. Rob, thanks so much for your recording. And yes, we are all envious that you got to fly the A380. And now we have a number of comments about the fuel and exhaustion and starvation accidents that we talked about last week. First, here's this recording from Daniel Switkin. Hey, Max. It's Daniel Switkin. I had a uh, comment and a question about uh, episode 318 about uh, fuel starvation. The first was about the totalizer. They are great devices and I use them. The two warnings that I would give is that if you are a renter, for example, or in a partnership, or you share a plane with other owners, if you don't refuel yourself, you don't know how much fuel is in the tanks because you don't know if the previous pilot used the totalizer correctly. The second one is that the totalizer is not aware of any fuel leaks. So for example, if you left a fuel cap off and you were venting fuel in the air, the totalizer will happily tell you that you still have plenty of fuel left. So it's very important to check both the fuel gauges and the totalizer since they have different kinds of error and go with the gauge that tells you you have less fuel. As for the question, I was wondering what kind of advice you would give to a pilot who is running low on fuel and not sure if they're going to make it. An obvious one would be to not descend for the airport to give them a better chance of gliding down. But what other steps would you recommend? Thanks. Daniel, thank you for your comments. And if you ever want to leave audio feedback as Daniel did, just go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on listener questions at the top of the page. Now, I totally agree with Daniel's comments. And yes, if I were unsure of my fuel levels, I would stay high to remain within gliding distance of the airport throughout my entire approach to land. I would certainly check to see that I had leaned the mixture as much as possible. And I'd also throttle back to a lower throttle setting as that would increase my range. And if it was necessary to get priority to land, I would either state minimum fuel or declare an emergency. I did that once over 30 years ago, returning from my first really long cross country from Scottsdale, Arizona to Palo Alto. I was flying an older 182 and felt that the fuel gauges were unreliable, and I was worried that I was running low on fuel. This was the flight that I talked about in episode 227 when I was a low-time IFR pilot and was picking up significant ice in the clouds. At one point, the clouds parted and I saw the Salinas Airport, so I asked to land, and I was told I'd need to wait until an airplane completed an instrument approach to the runway unless I was declaring an emergency. Well, I took the hint, declared an emergency, and landed, and I found I had about 13 gallons in the tank, about an hour of fuel, and declaring an emergency and landing were among the better decisions that I made in flight that day. The other thing I'd keep in mind is that if I were to have uh, the engine quit, I would definitely pull the RPM knob all the way back, which would extend my glide distance. And here's an email from Steve Weber, who writes, I have a 1959 Piper Pacer, actually one of the many tri-pacers that have been converted back to a pacer. Your recent episode 318 included a summary of fuel starvation incidents that included a pacer. The transcript noted that the pilot, quote, switched the fuel tank into the 12 o'clock position on exiting the aircraft, presumably to select the fuel to off. Although there are STCs to modify the selector to other options with a both position, for example, the standard one is a four position selector with the following positions, up, right tank, forward, left tank, down, off, and back, off. This implies that he selected the right tank on exit rather than off. I've always paid close attention to this selector when making any changes, given that you have a 50% chance of selecting off, better to make sure. My mental reminder is that you always want the airplane moving up or forward, back and down are not as good. That said, there are a couple of other issues to keep in mind that I'm curious about. Many tri-pacers were delivered with an auxiliary tank under the rear seat that uses an electric pump to move fuel to the right wing tank through the rear fuel pickup line. The two issues possible from this are, one, the rear fuel pickup does not feed the engine. Airplanes equipped with this system are placarded for no takeoff or landing on the right tank if less than one-third full. If they had right selected and pitched up to go around, they could starve the engine of fuel. The four gallons in the right tank afterward would be less than one-third full. Two, there is a check valve that prevents fuel from draining out of the right wing back into the much lower auxiliary tank. If this check valve is faulty or the actuator is not fully closed, it can empty the fuel from the right wing tank. No idea if this tri-pacer had the system, but would be neat to understand that. The pacer is generally a simple airplane, but with a relatively complicated fuel system that is worth understanding well. Keep up the good work.
And here's an email from patron supporter Mike Jesh. He writes regarding the recent episode about fuel starvation exhaustion. You mentioned how important it is to know how your fuel system works, and I agree. I include a discussion of these possibilities when I do especially high-performance endorsement training. Most fuel-injected engines have a fuel system that features plumbing that returns excess fuel back to a fuel tank. But which tank? Some airplanes return it to the currently selected tank, while others return it to only one tank. There are bonanzas that return only to the left tank, and there are other bonanzas that return to the selected tank. The 310 I teach in returns excess fuel to the main tank. So if you switch to the aux tank before there's enough room in the main tanks for that fuel, the fuel will instead get pumped overboard. There is a limitation that requires that the main tanks be burned for 60 to 90 minutes, depending upon the aux tank size, before switching to the auxes and crews. If that fuel gets pumped overboard because of improper tank management, that can lead to a fuel exhaustion accident. And this comes from Skip Warren via Facebook. This is regarding the Challenger that lost both engines just short of the runway at Naples. He writes, from my long past maritime lawyer days, I remember that the API, the American Petroleum Institute, said that water settles out of gasoline at the rate of 15 minutes per foot of depth. That might explain why the sampling did not catch all the water. Two hours of flight would likely have been long enough for enough water to have settled to cause the failures. And I looked online, I found AC 20-125, and it says, according to the FAA, aviation gas has a minimum settling time of 15 minutes per foot of depth. Turbine fuel has a minimum settling time of 60 minutes per foot depth. And the FAA also recommends a two-hour settling period and flotation suction to drain fuel from the top of a storage tank. And this comes from patron supporter Mark Newton, who I've met when I visited Australia. He says, hi, Max. Good episode on fuel accidents, a little technique I was taught. As a student that I've carried forward since, before your flight with full tanks, draw a small table of numbers on your scratch pad. The column headings are the fuel tank identifiers, example, left, right, left tip, etc. And under each heading, you want to list the tank's fuel capacity in cruise hours descending to zero in 30-minute increments. For example, on my RV6, I know I have five hours total endurance at the cruise burn rate accomplished with 2.5 hours in each tank. So my table looks like this. And he's got two columns, one labeled left and one labeled right. And under each of those columns, he's got the same set of numbers, which is descending downward 2.5 to 1.5, 1, 1, 0 0.5, and 0, 0.0. As your flight progresses, every time you change tanks, you cross off numbers from the top of the table for whichever tank you were burning from. So if I start in the left tank, I'll run for 30 minutes, change tanks, then change again every hour after that to keep the tank weights roughly balanced. That means on my first tank change, I'll cross off 2.5 from the L column, then an hour later I'll cross off 2.5 and 2.0 on the R column, then an hour later on the next tank change. I'll cross off 2.0 and 1.5 from the L column. And each time I cross out a number, I'll annotate it with the time. That allows the table, which is a form of fuel log, to act as a gross error check on my other fuel management systems, including gauges, totalizer, and flight plan numbers with very little effort. The top uncrossed number in each column estimates the approximate remaining endurance left in that tank. It's only in 30-minute increments and doesn't take extra burn during climb and taxi into account, but that's okay. It's still an almost zero-effort way of answering the questions, which tank has the most fuel remaining, about how much is left, and am I late changing tanks? And if I find myself in the 0.5s, that's where my personal minimums kick in to find a nearby alternate. I never want to land with less than an hour on board, and if one tank is at 0.5, it means the other will be soon and I can make a plan early. It's really very easy. It works on every airplane, no matter how primitive its fuel measurement system is, and I don't think I've encountered many other pilots doing it. Maybe it should be more widespread. The other thing that's very useful, most glass cockpits can be configured to give you an audible alarm or cast alert as a tank change reminder based on your burn. Nobody wants to forget to swap, but if you do, the avionics can help. And from Mark Sletton, and this is regarding one of the accidents we talked about, which was a Comanche November 5235 Papa. He says, you mentioned this mishap in the list of fuel-related mishaps. This incident occurred at my home airport, IL-48. 
I realize it wasn't really necessary for the topic, but you did mention that the pilot owner who died in the accident was sitting in the right seat. The pilot rated passenger, who, beyond being an airline captain, was also a CFI, was getting seat time. The owner's son was to be in flight instruction, and the pilot getting seat time was to be his instructor. The rest of the story, which was briefly mentioned in the NTSP report, is that the owner also held an AMP certificate. In talking with people who knew him, it's possible that he's the one who incorrectly installed the bladder tanks. He says, I understand the temptation to do as much of the maintenance work on your own airplane as you can get away with to save money. Heck, I built an airplane for that very reason. But this accident really highlights the fact that some jobs should be left to the pros. As its builder, I'm authorized to perform the annual condition inspections on our plane, but I farm out certain jobs, magneto inspections, repairs, pedostatic system testing, etc., to the professionals. I just developed a lesson plan on airworthiness requirements as part of my training to obtain a flight instructor certificate. Part of the lesson was a review of the section in FAR Part 43 describing preventive maintenance, as well as the letter from the FAA legal interpretation that says, all-inclusive list of preventive maintenance jobs in Part 43 is not actually all-inclusive. And he says, see the co-legal interpretation, that's C-O-L-E-A-L, This, along with this mishap, makes me wonder what else are pilot owners doing to their airplanes without telling anyone. All pilots learn what's necessary to determine airworthiness during initial flight training, but how many of us actually ask to see maintenance logs when we rent an airplane, or before we fly in a friend's airplane, or a client's airplane? I suspect as I embark on the next part of my journey providing flight instruction in other people's airplanes, especially older ones, that airworthiness will be a prominent topic. Mark, thanks so much for your email. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you, and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on Contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash support to support the show financially. You can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can-